Just 72 hours passed after the last general election before the new Prime Minister Boris Johnson met with Rupert Murdoch. We'll never know what was discussed at that meeting, or for that matter, at any of the other meetings Mr Murdoch and the government have shared since the last election. What we do know is that over the last five years, Murdoch's interests have consistently been put before those of the public. The public inquiry into evidence of corruption among the police and the press, Leveson Part 2 as it's known, was abruptly cancelled by the government before it could begin its work. That decision was opposed by a majority of the public, by international free speech advocates like Article 19, by the National Union of Journalists, and by the inquiry chair, Sir Brian Leveson himself. They all understood that a web of criminality and corruption exposed by the first part of the Leveson inquiry needed proper investigation. But instead of taking a tough stand on crime and corruption, the government buckled to appease Mr Murdoch and other press owners and executives. The government has also stood by as Mr Murdoch's papers have peddled conspiracy theories, fake news and disinformation. And earlier this year, it was no surprise when the government funneled £35 million into the coffers of the largest newspapers in a Covid advertising deal, including Murdoch's titles, of course, while their independently owned competitors were left to rot. Instead of implementing the Leveson recommendations for an independent regulator, the Prime Minister has done nothing while Murdoch's papers persist with Ipso, a sham complaints handler controlled by press executives with close links to the government. Chaired by a former Conservative government politician, the Ipso system fails to protect the public. Its closeness to government is more befitting of a dictatorship than a liberal democracy. Our Prime Minister may not have the stomach to take on the press, but this evening we hear from someone who does. Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister of Australia from 2007 to 2010 and again in 2013. During his time in office, he led Australia's response to the global financial crisis of 2008, took decisive action on climate change and made an unprecedented apology to Indigenous Australians for the forced removals of children earlier in the 20th century. He did this against a backdrop of Murdoch dominance in Australian media, filled with the climate change denialism and the kind of right-wing populism we've come to expect from Murdoch outlets. Now a petition launched by Mr Rudd calling for a royal commission into Australian media ownership has been signed by more than half a million Australians concerned about Murdoch's dominance. Here is that rare thing, a world leader with the courage to stand up for the public and call out the damaging influence Murdoch wields over politicians. I am delighted to introduce him this evening and I hope Boris Johnson's taking some notes. In conversation with hacked off board director, Professor Stephen Barnett, the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd, thank you very much for doing this. Um, as Hugh said, uh, you launched a petition in October calling for a Royal Commission uh, quotes to ensure a strong, diverse Australian news media, which specifically takes aim at Murdoch's media dominance in Australia. Now, that's a, a pretty extraordinary step for a former prime minister. What, what persuaded you to do it? Well, this country it had just gone too far. It's a gradual process, but over the last decade, uh, Murdoch's abuse of his media monopoly in this country had just reached unprecedented... Um, uh, heights. Uh, Murdoch owns 70% of the print media in Australia. Uh, in my home state of Queensland, uh, which is the third largest in Australia, he owns 100% of the print media. And so as a result, um, it is simply the outworking of uh, a monopoly power, which whether it was of the left or the right, frankly, is just bad for the democracy. But secondly, the abuse of the monopoly power here has driven uh, the media agenda and the political agenda to the right and the far right. Uh, in fact, I fear that the long-term trajectory for Australia's media landscape would be what uh, Murdoch has already pulled off in America with uh, Fox News. So I simply took a decision, which is um, enough is enough. It's time to stand up and to try and do something, uh, which is why I launched this uh, petition to establish a Royal Commission into his abuse of media monopoly power. Now, the, the petition specifically says um, that the way he uses his powers to attack opponents in business and politics uh, by blending editorial opinion with news reporting and Australians who hold contrary views have felt intimidated into silence. Uh, and in your book, you actually call Murdoch the greatest, most malignant cancer 
on our Australian democracy. Now, those are pretty forceful words. You yourself been on the receiving end of that kind of intimidation. Can you give us a sense of how it actually works and how it affects uh, senior politicians and uh, people who are, who are trying to lead the country? Well, actually, the most uh, eloquent uh, depiction of uh, this, I thought, came recently from a uh, former Murdoch employee in the United Kingdom who had interviewed recently for the um, BBC three-part series on Murdoch's power, uh, said that if you cross Murdoch, it's a bit like having an entire division of the SS to send on you um, because uh, that's how he operates. Uh, and his policy and strategy is very clear uh, to uh, silence you, but more importantly, to use you as an example uh, to others, uh, not to raise your voice uh, against um, uh, the, uh, uh, the leader of this particular syndicate uh, and the abuse of their power. What I therefore have objected to most acutely in Australia is just the culture of fear it creates here. Uh, most people that I speak to in the political class of the uh, mainstream centre-left and centre-right agree with everything that I have said publicly. But most would always say, oh, mate, um, you'll understand why I'm not speaking out. He'll just come after me. <laughs> now, I understand that. I mean, they're in active politics. Uh, I left the political scene six or seven years ago. Um, but it's an indication where we've got to, where no one feels confident enough to actually call a spade a spade in dealing with uh, the Murdoch beast. It becomes somewhat like the political equivalent of a mafia operation, uh, whereby you fear uh, the reputational damage, the evisceration of your character, um, and, uh, and frankly, the falsification of news as they seek to destroy uh, anyone who stands against either their ideological or their business interests. And presumably that has an effect uh... Uh, a, a, an impact on any government's ability to act in the national interest if they're yeah, trying to do fair. something that's that, that that's contrary to 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 the Mur the Murdoch worldview. I think that's true. I mean, um, uh, I make no apology for the fact that prior to my own election as prime minister, I went to see Murdoch and spent a lot of time with Murdoch's editors, trying to get a better deal for the coverage of the Labour Party uh, going into the two thousand and seven election. Um, but <clears throat> I think no one would argue that as Prime Minister of Australia uh, that I did anything for Murdoch. In fact, it was probably a failure to do anything for Murdoch and, in fact, prosecuting an agenda which he found ideologically and commercially uncomfortable for him uh, that he turned so viciously against my government. So, therefore, um, it is... Uh, the culture of fear for prime ministers and senior cabinet ministers and even backbenchers uh, that um, the safest and most secure political uh, future for yourself is carved out by never ever crossing the business or the ideological interests of uh, the Murdoch beast. Because if you do, you'll find out about it, if not the next day, then certainly the next week on the front pages of the paper. Now, I want to come back to your time in office uh, in a minute. Just one question before I do. This petition um, got over half a million signatories before it was closed, which is a pretty extraordinary number in a population of 25 million. Is, that, is this something that you think has struck a popular nerve as well as a political nerve? Is this something that people, people in Australia actually talk about um, and, and worries them? I think so. And, um, and people who are not normally engaged in formal political, formal political discussion of the type that we're having here. These, uh, if, if you simply go into a shop somewhere in Australia to buy a pie, uh, you'll be surprised the number of people who will say, I signed your petition, Kev. Uh, I just think it's wrong. No one should have that much power. And I get that right across the country and not from political elites, but from ordinary people, because they formed a view that um, no one uh, in the media in our country should have that much power in their hands. And I've seen too much evidence of its abuse. One of the areas of abuse which has touched people most acutely across the country was Murdoch's intervention with the uh, Conservative uh, uh, parties here <clears throat> going into the 2013 election when they agreed to fundamentally change the nature of our policy and plan 
which was being implemented at the time to roll out a national broadband network for the entire nation. Australia, as you know, is vast in its size, small in its population, and so to overcome the tyranny of distance and to link the country with the economy of the 21st century, uh, we undertook to build a massive um, project, $43 billion project, of fiber optic to the premises for every household and business in the country. Um, the railways of the 21st century. Murdoch um, got wind of this um, and figured that the problem with our proposal was that it would create um, direct and immediate competition for his existing cable uh, television entertainment network called Fox uh, Entertainment here in Australia, um, by enabling, therefore, companies like Netflix to use the fibre optic link to people's homes to basically sell their own movie and entertainment services as competition to Murdoch. So Murdoch went on the warpath, and the Conservatives uh, went into the 2013 election at a campaign launch at Murdoch's own Fox Studios in Sydney and promised that they would only uh, have a national broadband network which uh, did not deliver fibre optic to the home but stopped short and that the last link would be copper, thereby slowing down the entire delivery and thereby undermining the broadband revolution which we had planned for uh, Australian society and the whole economy. The net result seven years later, in the midst of a COVID lockdown, is that most Australians have had absolutely crappy broadband. So this penetrates through to people everywhere. It's not just you know, an elite concern about high politics. It's that this guy's ruthless prosecution of his business interests affects their ability to get decent broadband to run their small business in Udnadatta. And uh, presumably it's very difficult for a party uh, as you were in 2013 to put across the benefits to ordinary people of decent, fast, direct-to-home broadband when you're faced with a propaganda barrage by a powerful publisher. Very much so. Um, as you know, a lie repeated often enough in the mind of many becomes the truth. Uh, I think um, uh, that has been used in an earlier period in world politics, which we thought we'd got over. Um, and certainly um, when you're um, in the business of simply seeking to advance an argument, whether it's on climate change or the National Broadband Network, which is here are the facts of what we face. Here is what we're planning to build. Here's the timetable for doing it. Here's the advantages which will flow um, for running your business from home or having effective an effective ability to move people's medical records at speed across the country uh, through uh, patient control medical records or remote area medicine, etc. But um, the way which Murdoch operates is that not only does he deny you the space to do that, <clears throat> that the barrage you face instead uh, is uh, always cleverly masked. It's never about his commercial interests directly. Uh, it's about the massive cost blow out of the system or, or massive inefficiencies in laying it out, all to discredit, delegitimize um, the project, but importantly, to delegitimize the people trying to roll out the project, namely me as Prime Minister at the time. That's the way in which he operates. It's also, as we discussed at the beginning of this um, uh, interview, the convergence of fact with opinion uh, so that it becomes as one um, and therefore... Uh, the ability to form a rational judgment just based on the facts is denied 70% of the country because they're, they're reading a propaganda broadsheet. Yeah, I, I think that's something that we're familiar with in, in, in the UK as well, this sort of uh, mm. the blending of, uh, of, of opinion and, and news. Can I just go back one minute to the 2007 election? And, and you, you said that you went to meet Murdoch before that election. Mm. And I remember Blair telling the Leveson inquiry very much the same thing, that he felt it was important. This was a powerful publisher and he needed to talk to him. Do you feel at the time that you felt it necessary to make any compromises in, in policy terms, in the conversations that you had with him in order to get elected? No, I didn't. Uh, I simply explained to him um, what my programme was across the board um, because I had no confidence that his individual editors would have done that fairly. So I wanted to say what I was going to do on business, uh, small business, um, and uh, in areas of... Um, uh, environmental policy and social policy and the rest. But Murdoch's a clever beast, you know. He works out 
when the natural political cycle is about to turn. And he figured in this case in Australia with 12 years of conservative government before me, uh, that my predecessor's time was about up. And even if they launched a massive media campaign against me, which in part they did still, it was unlikely that they would prevent me from being elected. And so therefore, usually at about five minutes to midnight, they click in and try to provide, quote, a bit of balanced coverage until they then uh, seek to extract your carotid artery after the election. Uh, and that's very much uh, his, uh, his uh, manner of uh, proceeding. Uh, but a direct answer to your question is, did I provide any policy undertakings? Zero. And the record of my government is we delivered zero in terms of the Murdoch ideological agenda or the Murdoch um, uh, business agenda. As I said, that's probably explained why he subsequently turned on me, my government, so viciously. Well, that's where I wanted to go to next, because um, there was a, a famous case when the, the British Prime Minister John Major gave evidence to Leveson saying that in the in the run up to the 97 election here, uh, Murdoch made it clear to him that he didn't like Major's policies on Europe and expected him to change those policies in return for Murdoch's support. And Major refused. And uh, there was a landslide which may or may not have been coincidental in the 97 election for Labour. So when when Murdoch turned and uh, in in during that period of government, uh, leading up to 2010, um, were any similar kind of overtures made to you? This is what I want you to do. And if you don't, then you you can uh, expect us to turn against you. Or did it just the worm just turn without any warning? No, there was nothing like that prior to the election. And if there had been, I would have uh, rejected it. Um, and the evidence, as I said, in the track record is after the event. There is nothing in our policy record in government which reflects any such uh, undertaking to uh, the Murdoch beast. You see, um, again, um, Murdoch's overall play is that uh, in our case, he would regard uh, Labour governments as episodic irritations to be dispensed with as rapidly as possible unless they became centre-right governments in their own form. I was never a centre-right government. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, we ran a quite radical intervention and strategy on the economy uh, to deal with the global financial crisis. We ran an intervention and strategy, certainly on the environment. Uh, and we also um, brought about fundamental um, uh, reforms to the public health system in the country as well and the education system, state education system. So he would have found, I think, you know, very little to cheer about. Uh, barely six months into my government, the uh, program of delegitimizing me as the leader of the government then began in earnest. Um, I remember the day, I think in about June of 2008, when the front page of the paper um, uh, ran as a news story the word chaos, uh, which was uh, their attempt to describe the internal workings of my government. Uh, as the subsequent documentary histories have demonstrated at the period, it was a normal, methodical, cabinet-led government. Um, but um, because we were not bending the knee to the Murdoch beast, uh, they decided to unleash their editors against us. And they did. And it became vicious, personal, ugly. Um, and uh, from their point of view, ultimately successful. Did you have journalists privately apologising? I mean, did, did any, do a Murdoch journalist simply say, I'm really sorry, this is the job that we've been told to do? Or... Was it simply, without apology, these are the headlines, these are the stories, uh, take it or leave it? No, 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 they routinely privately apologise. <laughs> and uh, the number of private apologies, it makes you feel like a Catholic priest sometimes, the number of confessions you have to hear uh, in the secret of the secular confessional <laughs> from all these Murdoch journos who say, oh, mate, it wasn't me, I got told to do it. Um, sorry about that. Or the other favourite one of mine is, I didn't write that story which appears under my byline. It was rewritten uh, by the editors um, uh, on instructions from on high. Um, and to the point where you can see a story which is white turned into a story which is black. And so I've lost count of the number of um, uh, Murdoch journalists and even a number of uh, people who have occupied editorial positions uh, who in the, the the, uh, the quietness of the confessional uh, will, will let you know off the record uh, the amount of pressure they've come under. Uh, so um, it's a strange beast.
I guess some of them will have signed the petition as well, but maybe anonymously. Um, Actually, I, I got a message today from a former Murdoch employee who said she'd signed, and she'd acted as an editor, that she'd signed the petition and she said most of her former Murdoch employee friends and some current ones had signed it as well. That's very that's very interesting. Do you think that you, you talked about how things worked in your uh, 07 to 2010 administration? Do you think that Murdoch's right wing views have become more pronounced over the last 10 years? Some people look at um, point to Fox News in the States and the New York Post and, and suggest that, uh, that, that that they become more shrill and more partisan over the last 10 years. Is that is that your view in Australia? Yeah, you see, one of the reasons I've decided to speak out now rather than 10 years ago, even though this was bad then, it was bad then, but it's become bloody impossible now. Uh, if I could summarise it in these terms, in around about when I was first elected in 2007, uh, in the Murdoch media uh, was probably then about 70-30 against the Australian Labor Party uh, in terms of the balance of news coverage and uh, editorial opinion. Um, my job was to try and get it down to something closer to 50-50. Uh, but during that election campaign of 07, when people often say, but he backed you, well, for God's sake, um, there were at least three or four attempts uh, in the lead up to that election to take my head off altogether on a whole series of concocted personal scandals. People seem to have forgotten those because I survived them. But what has happened in the period since 2010 um, over the last decade is that, you know, 70-30 figure has become close to 100 to zero. Um, and if you want an evidence point of that, we've done this research recently. Because we're a federation in Australia, we have both um, national and state elections. In the last decade, we've had 19 federal and state elections in this country. Um, in all 19 of those, the Labor Party has been campaigned viciously against by the Murdoch media. All of Murdoch's uh, daily tabloid papers, which dominate the news in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Hobart, Adelaide. Um, only in Perth, they're not the mainstream paper. Uh, quite apart from the national daily paper, the, uh, the Australian, and uh, their equivalent of Fox in Australia, which is Sky on television. Um, in 19 out of 19, this is not a statistical error, this is 19 out of 19, uh, you see this vicious campaign. And it's not just the pre-election editorial which says, on the balance of all the factors uh, concerned, we've decided as a editorial team of this newspaper that uh, we're going to endorse uh, the Conservative parties or endorse the Labour Party. That wouldn't worry me so much. But it's the overwhelming bias <laughs> in the lead up and through the campaigns which, as I said, runs almost 100-0. And, and it is it continues with a degree of arrogance, which I think friends in uh, the UK would find sort of just breathtaking in terms of how bad it gets. Here in my own home state of Queensland, we've only just had another election uh, where we calculated the bias factor again by looking at each day's coverage of the state election campaign. And in this state, uh, which is a decentralised state, uh, all the newspapers, the Cairns Post, the Townsville Bulletin, the Mackay Mercury, uh, the Rockhampton Morning Bulletin, the Bundaberg News Mail, uh, uh, right down to the Sunshine Coast Daily, the Brisbane Courier Mail, the Gold, Gold Coast Bulletin, all of them are Murdoch owned and vicious in their anti-Labour coverage. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, as I said, 19 out of 19 is not a statistical error. And, and it, it's, it's, it's definitely got become more partisan over the last few years, in, in, in your view. I presume we're talking here not just about, as you say, the editorials saying vote for the other side, but the choice of news stories, the agenda setting, the headlines on a, on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's, um, look, it's become positively Pravda-like for a far-right conservative agenda. I could best summarise it in these terms. Um, in the period that I was um, a leader of the Australian Labor Party and Prime Minister, the Murdoch media by and large was a centre-right group. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's become a far-right group on the normal barometers of policy. Um, and, uh, for example, on climate change, 
um, the uh, Murdoch media here is the largest single factor driving the Conservative Party in this country uh, continually in the direction of a denialist agenda, despite the fact that Australia is the driest continent on earth and therefore is already the recipient of uh, one of the harshest impacts of climate change already underway. But because of Murdoch's far-right ideology on climate change, where he's on the record directly uh, disputing the science, uh, and his son Lachlan Murdoch is no, is no better, um, uh, this has a palpable impact on the way in which um, politics is conducted in this country and on policy issues of relevance to everybody. I think that's the other factor in this debate. It's not just the abuse of um, editorial and news power uh, to campaign viciously for one side of politics against the other, because some would say uh, that's a publisher's right. I actually think publishers have broader responsibilities than that in the separation of news reporting and opinion. But the other pernicious effect of the abuse of this monopoly in Australia uh, is that it uh, utterly skews the parameters for our national conversation about our critical national futures, including on climate, which for us is increasingly existential. So this is not a, a minor matter. It's not just, you know, the political, you know, boutique political interests of a centre-left party. It actually goes to the very lifeblood of the democracy. So when I say it's a cancer on our democracy, I actually mean that it's withering away the vitality of the body politic. And, and essentially what you're saying is that people's everyday lives, whether it's in terms of access to quick broadband, um, doing something about climate change, are actually being influenced by the Murdoch's editorial approach to those issues. Very much so. I mean, uh, there are um, institutions which have done systematic analyses, for example, of Murdoch's coverage uh, in just the last uh, year or two uh, on climate change. Um, overwhelmingly, the, um, uh, the news slash opinion pages of uh, the uh, Murdoch papers are dominated by climate change denialist writers, um, almost to a factor of 100 to zero. But then the news coverage is not a whole, a whole that a lot better. There's one further pernicious impact though, if such a dominant media monopoly in any country, be it of the centre left or the centre right or the far left or the far right, effectively becomes a protection racket for their preferred political party in office. And that's what's happened here. The Murdoch party, as I call them in Australia, functioning almost as a political party in coalition with the conservative parties who formally contest elections here, what happens as a consequence of that, when you act as a protection racket for so long, it actually produces corruption. And what we've seen in recent years in Australia is Australia bit by bit starting to slide down the Transparency International Index. And there's a correlation here. The federal government in Australia for 100 years has been one of the cleanest in the world. That's because of the high calibre of our public institutions and also a fairly you know, forensic media. Um, but if you have a media which is increasingly coward, guess what? Um, corruption begins to creep in. And I've now lost count of the number of corruption scandals, small and great, which have now erupted in federal politics in this country, to the point that we now have an active and necessary debate on the establishment of a federal anti-corruption commission. Ten years ago, when I was Prime Minister, this was never debated because neither my predecessor, Mr Howard, could be accused of being corrupt. No one was able to label any accusations of corruption against my government. But here we are a decade later, and um, there are literally seven or eight significant corruption scandals brewing. And I'm not talking about the standard fare in politics, which is politicians or parliamentarians abusing their expense entitlements. That comes and goes depending on the season. I'm talking about the abuse of public funds in significant quantums uh, for one thing or another. So when I say cancer on the democracy, it's, um, as I said, um, constraining the parameters of public debate and public discussion, acting as a protection racket for 
a preferred political party, which is seen as uh, the most useful in looking after the ideological and business interests of the media mogul in question. But then the consequence is by acting as a protection racket, the body politic becomes more corrupt. And that is one of the other reasons I fear for the simple continuation of current arrangements. There's clearly a lot of backing, uh, political backing, both privately and publicly for your position. Um, given the impact on the body politic, on public interest policies, shouldn't politicians simply be a bit braver and stand up to him? Or is that just being naive? Look, I am often um, attacked um, in my current capacity <clears throat> for not having stood up a decade ago, to which my response is, it wasn't as bad then as it is now. <laughs> it was pretty bad then, but it's much, much worse now. And the evidence, the uh, quantifiable evidence is already there. Um, and secondly, to be fair to our government, uh, we did initiate um, uh, an initial uh, inquiry into media diversity uh, in 2012 called the Finkelstein Inquiry, uh, which uh, drew heavily on some of the work already done by um, uh, Lord Deverson in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and so um, for those reasons, um, I think the criticisms of us for not having acted uh, decisively earlier are somewhat misplaced. But I am very much conscious of the pressures which members of parliament and leaders of political parties are under because the Murdoch beast has their uh, careers in their hands on a daily basis. And one of the reasons I've gone to the public and to the people direct is along these lines, uh, Steve. It's to say, uh, be strong and have a good courage because actually the people are fed up with this. The ordinary people of our country are fed up with this. And to demonstrate through sheer numbers that there is a large swathe of people who are not just fed up, but want things to change. And I think over time that should give the political class more courage to act. Um, but I only launched this uh, petition a couple of months ago. And if you launch a, a digital petition in our country, you are given a maximum of um, 28 days where it can be online. And I think the body politic was stunned in Australia that we could <clears throat> uh, collect half a million signatures when you'll be, won't be surprised to know that through that whole period, the Murdoch media ne never reported its existence once. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm shocked and horrified. Um, uh, so just thinking, uh, taking that into the future, um, where, where the petition takes us, there's now going to be a Senate inquiry uh, into media diversity in Australia, which I understand isn't going to be reporting until well into next year. Is that going to make any difference? And, and are there, do, do you think there are any chances of real policy change in this area in the, in the short to medium term? Yes, I believe there are, because the public mood is mounting in this country. And the public mood is, um, is not a fickle thing. It's actually grown up over a long period of time. Australians, by and large, as you know from your own experience of us, uh, we're a fairly relaxed bunch of people down here. Um, and it takes quite a lot to uh, make people angry. They're angry about this. And so I believe this mood will um, grow and become more intense. Um, and interestingly, each time the Murdoch uh, media in the last uh, couple of months have tried to take my head off um, through um, uh, further reporting of uh, my crimes against humanity, whatever they happen to be on a given day in the Murdoch media, there's always a new one. <clears throat> the, the mood of the Australian public is now one which describes Murdoch's uh, reaction to this as Murdoch panic. Um, a spontaneous uh, hashtags spring up around the country. Uh, Murdoch petition panic. Um, I haven't produced these, just the public are producing these. There's an organic movement underway. And so what's my um, aspiration and belief? Uh, that we will achieve um, policy and legislative change. I can't give you a precise timetable for it. The Senate inquiry was not my idea. It spontaneously combusted in the Australian Parliament the week after my petition closed because the senators saw the mood change. 
And this Senate inquiry will haul people, I presume, from News Corporation before them to give evidence. Uh, this will be very interesting to observe as to how it unfolds. Um, and uh, it'll be one stepping stone in a much longer term process. As for the fate of a Royal Commission, let's wait and see uh, whether federal or state governments take up um, the particular uh, uh, request of more than half a million Australians. Uh, but this is a broader exercise as well. In the last 24 hours, I've launched a further national appeal uh, to Australians, asking them to join my pledge not to use um, Murdoch's company, which is called realestate.com.au, which is Murdoch's uh, online platform for advertising the uh, purchase and uh, sale of um, properties in this country, of houses, um, and for rental properties uh, and the advertisement of them as well. Um, it's 62% owned by Murdoch. I saw a valuation saying it's a $19 billion company. And given that most of his print operations in this country do not earn a profit, this is his profit centre in the country. So what I've gone out literally in the last few days and said is, um, if you're fed up with Murdoch's attitude to climate change, then join me in my pledge not to use uh, realestate.com uh, for the future. Um, now, I think this will... Um, if I thought I had some enemies in News Corporation as of yesterday, I think I'm about to get a whole lot more because it actually goes to the very beating, pulsating heart uh, of the Murdoch financial beast. <laughs> so, um, I, I, but I think... Just a couple more questions, just just on, on that particular one, a personal question, if you like. I mean, you've clearly decided to stick your head, uh, well, not just your head, but but every, every part of your anatomy above the parapet. Um, and you look pretty relaxed. Is there part of you that's actually a bit apprehensive about the, uh, the, the stuff that's going to be coming your way from um, a very powerful publisher? Not really. Um, and the reason is that um, uh, for you know, more than a decade, I've had most things thrown at me um, by these folks. Um, and there's an advantage and an upside for them having done so, so much in the past, and that is the currency has been debased. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, um, if I, as a former prime minister of the country, am too frightened to put my head up, for God's sake, um, uh, how can we expect the same of those who are currently in office? Uh, so I think there's something of an uh, ethical responsibility here to demonstrate some leadership. I'm sure members of my family don't particularly appreciate it because um, when you're in political and public life in this country, uh, they tend to uh, uh, go after you on a broad front. Um, and as I said, that wonderful interview from the former, I think, News of the World uh, reporter uh, in the BBC three-part series recently on Murdoch said, just get ready for that full division of the SS to, be, to descend on your personal life if you're a politician who stands in the road of the beast. But uh, I'm in the business of making a change in public life. Um, volume one of my autobiography is entitled Not for the Faint-Hearted. And let me tell you, taken on Murdoch is not for the faint-hearted. It's, it's full-blooded warfare. Never show up in a fight with Murdoch with a butter knife. Um, it's a street fight. And you need to know that before you do so. Final question. Uh, I think there will be many um, on the receiving end of that kind of um, vituperation that you've just, you've uh, you've described, who will be um, wish, wishing you luck and perhaps coming to join you in in the fight. Um, in the UK, there are a number of politicians um, who believe, still believe that. Um, Cozying up to Murdoch and adapting media policy to suit his agenda is a price worth paying uh, to get elected uh, if it wins his paper's support. Um, do you think that's right? You know, a decade ago, or a decade and a half ago, um, I would, as I said in my earlier comments, I make no criticism of political party leaders dealing with um, publishers and editors across the spectrum of the left and the right. 
And I didn't just go and see Murdoch. I saw uh, other um, editors from other newspaper and media organisations as well. Because your job as leader of a political party is to maximise the fair and balanced coverage of your particular argument. But there is a huge line to be drawn um, on doing that and arguing your case with those uh, media barons and publishers on the one hand to prostituting yourself on the other. Uh, to be very plain, um, one of our problems with the, uh, the Murdoch beast um, was as the Australian Labor Party, then in opposition when I was shadow foreign minister, our vitriolic hostility to the Iraq war from the get-go. Um, and so the attacks on us in Australian politics, particularly when the British Labor government under Tony Blair went the other way, um, the attacks on us through the Murdoch media at the time was that we were somehow lacking in patriotism, lacking in alliance solidarity, um, and, and not providing bipartisan support for the then Australian Conservative government uh, in the invasion of Iraq and what followed. So the reason I use that as an example is it's far better in the overall swings and roundabouts of history to stick up for your principles all the way through. Um, you usually come unstuck in the business of public, pro public life and public policy and public politics uh, when you fundamentally compromise on those principles. People understand in political life and the nature of parliamentary politics that some elements of compromise are necessary for legislation, for example, to pass. I understand that. I do get that. Um, but when you engage in acts of fundamental compromise to appease uh, public opinion as defined by a newspaper baron whose global agenda is far-right ideology playing always the politics of race, um, denying and uh, undermining climate change action wherever he can and minimising tax so that he has to pay less tax as a corporation, as an individual. My argument is uh, that when such a uh, uh, publishing empire has such a large foothold across the Anglosphere, uh, we have a responsibility to stand up uh, and to push back. Because you know something, one of the dilemmas in the West at the moment, across the wider West, in our uh, democratic uh, capitalist world, uh, led by the United States, in the United Kingdom and in Australia, uh, is that Murdoch, has had a pernicious influence on all of us uh, the last decade or more. In America, I doubt we would have ever seen Trump in the absence of Murdoch's Fox News. I believe the Republican Party would have remained a mainstream centre-right party were it not for the echo chamber of Fox News playing to the far-right constituency permanently within the uh, broader Republican establishment. And so the impact in the United Kingdom, I'm not sure Brexit would have happened in the absence of, um, of Murdoch's championing it uh, through the sun uh, and through um, uh, his other media interests. Maybe it would have, but I've noticed the relationship between Farage, for example, and Murdoch is um, surprisingly close. So the impact of this extraordinary phenomenon across these three English-speaking countries which have formed, played such a significant role, and let's call it the evolution of the idea of the West in the last couple of hundred years since the American Revolution. This is a bad development, not just for Oz. It's a bad development for all of us. And the sooner we stand up and defeat this, the better for all of our democracies. I think that's a, a, a great call to arms on, on which to finish. And I think um, I think there are some politicians in the UK who would do well to listen, to be honest, um, uh, as 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 well as in the US. Um, Kevin, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, insight into having to deal with, as you say, the beast uh, at first hand. And the consequences, I think, not just for Australian democracy, but for democracies, uh, as you say, in the Anglosphere. So uh, thank you again. Um, there will be a lot of people here cheering you on and watching very carefully to see what happens in the Senate and whether a Royal Commission and subsequent legislation 
actually emerges. Uh, and uh, maybe Australia could be the standard bearer for uh, the rest of the world. So thank you again. And I'm going to hand back to Hugh Grant. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for joining us for this special Hacked Off event. Murdoch's influence crosses borders with the UK, Australia and the US, all affected. It's important that we work together to protect our democracies. You can read more about what we at Hacked Off are doing to hold Murdoch and other newspapers owners to account on our website at hackinginquiry.org and on Twitter. Do sign up as a supporter if you've not already done so. Finally, we at the campaign want to extend our thanks to Kevin Rudd for being a part of this event this evening. We hope you enjoyed hearing from him. Thanks a lot.